amazing that God, who created the universe, loved you so much that he died to save you. It's amazing. It's amazing. This person writes, as a brainwave technologist, I often ask post-operative patients to smile to make sure their facial nerves are intact. It always struck me as odd to be asking this question right after brain surgery. So a colleague suggested I ask patients to just show me their teeth. So with this new phrase, I asked my next patient, Mr. Smith, show me your teeth. He shook his head. He says, the nurse has them. <laughs> I can identify with that because I have left the house to go preach without my teeth. I've, I've preached in here without my teeth. That's one of my wife's responsibilities to make sure I have my teeth and make sure I'm zipped up. I think three weeks ago I came here and I wasn't zipped up. She wasn't checking. That's true. I didn't take me that. <laughs> Luke chapter 11, verse 35 and 36 says this, See to it then that the light within you is not darkness. Therefore, if your whole body is full of light and no part of it dark, it will be just as full of light as when a lamp shines its light on you. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to present these morsels from your word, which are always victorious, Lord. We cannot go wrong if we stay in your word. It's our all-sufficient rule for faith and practice. And as we have the opportunity to share this, Lord, pray that you will guide the word to where you want it to go and, and that it will have the effect that you want it to have. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in the book of Judges, chapter 6, it's talking about the oppression of the Midianites against the uh, Israelites. And just a little bit of background about the Midianites and who those people were. Um, Abraham, after Sarah died, remarried, and his next wife's name was Keturah, and they had six sons. And the fourth one, his name was Midian. And the Midianites there then were descended from Abraham. The traders who sold Joseph into slavery in Egypt were Midianites. They were descended from Midian. When Moses ran away from Pharaoh, he went to Midian. He lived among the Midianites. He married a Midianite woman. His father-in-law was a, was a priest, it says, of God in Midian. And I don't know exactly what that means because they were not uh, God-fearing people. So he may have been a priest of another God, or there might have been an attempt for them to reach God. But he was a priest of, of Midian. So in Judges chapter 6, starting at verse 2, it says, Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. In other words, they were hiding out from these Midianites. Whenever the Israelites, verse 3, planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples <clears throat> invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them with their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. 
in this particular time, the Israelites were not serving God. They actually were serving Baal and Asherah. But they cried out to God for help because Baal and Asherah were never any help for them. And never would be and never will be. But this oppression went on for seven years. They were probably on the brink of starvation all that time. The oppression was a judgment from God because the Israelites had been doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. It seems that they had been worshiping other gods. Picking it up in verse number 7. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. They would stray away and be enticed to worship the Baals and the Chemosh and Molech and Asherah. And that's what they would do. Whenever they did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and often it says that they would turn to the Lord and he would rescue them and they would turn again. But it was always about idolatry. They worshipped the Baal and Asherah. What were the practices of Baal worship? Ritualistic Baal worship in a song looked a little like this. Adults would gather around the altar of Baal. Infants would then be burned alive as a sacrificial offering to the deity. Amid horrific screams and the stench of charred human flesh, congregants, men and women alike, would engage in bisexual orgies. That part of it was the Asherah worship. There was always a shrine to Baal and a shrine to Asherah next to it. Some people thought that Asherah was Baal's mother. But there was always a shrine which was represented by a pole or a tree to Asherah. And that's what the kind of activities they did in their worship of Asherah. And Asherah has different names in different cultures, but it's the same evil demon. And so is Baal and Chemosh and Molech. It's the same evil demon. They have worshipped him the same way with infant sacrifice. So one of the many times here that Israel cried out to God for relief from the judgment that they had brought on themselves is in Judges chapter 6, some of which we read already. The Midianites were cruel oppressors. You know, there's always been people, I mean, if you look right now at what's going on in Ukraine, there's a cruel oppressor. There have always been cruel oppressors, the Nazis. The Israelites cried out to God for help, for relief. And then Gideon was called. We go down to verse number 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Oprah that belonged to Joash the Beazerite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a winepress to keep it from the Midianites. Picture that. He harvested some wheat and he was hiding out inside of a winepress so that the Midianites wouldn't see him threshing the grain so that he could have some bread. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now here's a guy that's hiding out in a wine press. And the angel was calling him a mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, uh, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt 
But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? So Gideon was called to save Israel from the Midianites because they had cried out to him to, for relief from what they brought on themselves by worshiping the Baals and Asherah. So then, as you know the story, Gideon requested a sign. There was a fleece. Uh, he was testing to see if that was really going to happen. I'm not going to get into that part of it. But there is a battle coming. Gideon is appointed to lead an army against Midian. There's a battle coming. And today, there is a battle coming. There is. There's a battle coming. We go to chapter 7, verse number 1. Early in the morning, Jerubbaal, that is Gideon, he had a name, Jerubbaal. Baal was part of his name. They were really into this Baal worship. Not only that, but his father had made the idols to Baal and Asherah. His own father, he grew up in this. So Jerubbaal, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Moray. So God then went through a process of reducing the army of Gideon. Every man who was in fear was dismissed to go home. 22,000 of them left and went home, leaving 10,000. And God wanted the victory over the Midianites to be obviously his victory. To that end, the army was reduced to 300 men. There was a process, he said, sent the men over to drink, and some of them drank out of their hands, and some of them laughed. But anyway, it, that's how they uh, el eliminated all but 300 men out of the original 32,000. And then the Lord said to Gideon in verse 7, With the 300 men that laughed, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands, but all the others go home. So the army was reduced from 32,000 to 300 men. And verse 8, So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300, who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. Now the camp at Midian lay below him in a valley. And we go to verse number 16, we see what the plan is going to be. Dividing the 300 men into three companies, three groups of 100 each, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. So the empty jar, I'm thinking, was probably, they carried maybe some water or bread or some kind of provisions. All their provisions were left. They went home empty-handed. So they had all these jars there. And I don't know what the purpose of the original purpose of the jars was. I don't know. But they were empty at this point, And they put a torch in each one of those jars. And uh, they were, the torches could be hidden there until a certain moment. Verse number 17, watch me, he told them. Follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, in other words, the, the hundred that's with him, blow our trumpets. Then from all around the camp, blow yours and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Verse 19, Gideon and the hundred with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just, they, just after they changed the guard. They blew their trumpets, broke the jars that were in their hands. 
It's interesting to me that they did, just didn't pull the torch out. They broke the jar. Going down to verse number 20, the three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars. Grasping the torches in their left hand, holding in their right hand the trumpets they were to blow. There's no sword in their hand unless any of them had three hands. There's a torch and there's a trumpet. The trumpeters they were to blow, they shouted a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran crying out as they fled. They thought they were surrounded by a huge army because there were these lights all around them and trumpets all around them and shouts all around them and they ran around confused and started killing each other. Then they fled, they ran away and some other Israelites were called out to pursue them and a great victory was accomplished. Gideon grew up immersed in a culture of idolatry. His own father built the shrine to uh, Asherah and the altar to Baal where infants were burned alive in the sacrifice. He was only trying at this point to survive threshing wheat in a wine press so the Midianites wouldn't steal his grain, which they did to everybody. We are immersed in a culture of sin. Amen. And you know that's true. We're immersed in a culture of sin. Until God brings into the light of salvation, we're in sin. Until God brings you, me, us into that light. We're in sin. Believers look around and unless you're blind you are discomforted by what you see. Would you have been discomforted in a crowd of Baal worshippers burning infants alive? Yes. Some of those people had to cringe when this was happening. I can't, I can't understand that mindset, except that it was demon control. Would you have been discomforted by what the Asherah worshipers were doing? It's too disgusting to detail in church. And they did it in the open and in public. And it was a form of worship to what those people called the Queen of Heaven. We live in an increasingly ungodly culture. It's getting increasingly ungodly. It's getting worse. The culture is in darkness and happy about it. The people of Gideon's time were crying out to God for relief from the oppression of the Midianites. They were only concerned about their own lifestyle. They cried out to God so the Midianites wouldn't be stealing their food and trampling down their crops and stealing their animals. They were concerned about their own lifestyle. They weren't concerned about the, the Baal worship. They had rejected the one true God in favor of Baal and Asherah, which were the gods of the people around them that God had warned them not to become involved with. They only cried out to God when it suited them. They didn't turn to him. Gideon destroyed the altar to Baal that his father had built. And the townspeople came out and wanted to kill him. They said, who destroyed this altar to Baal and Asherah? Well, it was Gideon, the son of Joshua. They said, we want to kill him. The battle was not a conventional battle. God orchestrated an unconventional battle. 300 
against an innumerable force. God does things to bring glory to himself, which he deserves. Amen. Amen. There are battles every day. There's battles being fought all around us. Churches are shrieking. 80%, my pastor, who's the presbyter of the, of the section down there, South Central West section, 80% of the AG churches are in decline. 80%. Darkness is on the rise. People need the Lord. I'm convinced that powerful demons are at work. People need the Lord. Demon influence is in high places. Demon influence is in Washington, D.C. You wouldn't have gay marriage if it wasn't a, a demon influence. Christian believers are, are opposed to such things as abortion on demand, coddling gays, and the newest one, this gender business that they're doing to little kids. Sweden has outlawed the use of puberty blockers in children. We're still doing it. Sweden, the most progressive country, outlawed that. I have two uh, papers written by doctors who call that child abuse. Yes. But they're encouraging little kids in kindergarten and first, second grade to examine themselves and say, are you really a boy, are you really, they're encouraging that. Why that belongs in the school, I don't know, but it doesn't. Demon influence, demon influence. When the church was an important part of life in our culture, in this country, we didn't have so many social ills. The worst part of the great falling away is that so many souls are being lost. God called Gideon to lead a battle. The battle was very unconventional. God does things in his own way. He used the light that was in a jar. The jar had to be smashed. Why couldn't they just take the torch out of the jar? They had to smash the jar. I'm thinking that when the torch was in the jar, I don't know how big the jars were, I don't know how big the torch was. And I'm thinking that when the, if you put a lid on the jar, the torch is going to go out because it has to have oxygen. And I'm thinking that when the torch was in the jar, there would be less oxygen in there, so it would burn kind of not so brightly. And I'm thinking if they smashed the jar, that oxygen would rush in there, and that would just flare up. And that's what the enemy saw, that flaring up of all these torches. 300 all around it, flaring up. I'm thinking that's why they smashed the jar. It also might be symbolic. But three things were used in this battle. The shout, the trumpet, and the torch. So the shout in Psalm 98 verse 4 it says, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. We shout at the television. We shout at our kids' sporting events. Fishermen shout if they got a big one. We shout about all those things, but we don't shout about God. We don't shout out a phrase in church as we used to. I don't know why that is. I don't know. We're being oppressed. We're being held down. Psalm 47, verse 1. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. When's the last time you heard cries, cries of joy in our worship services? Never since I came here. Why is that? Are we being held down? 
by a spiritual force. Number two, the trumpet, Joshua 6.20. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted. And at a sound of a trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everything, char everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. That was the Battle of Jericho. The trumpets, combined with the shouts, brought down the walls of Jericho. God knocked the walls down, but they did what he said. The seventh time around, seven to seven, the seventh day they went around seven times, and they shouted and blew a trumpet, and the walls came down. So in Joshua 6.20, it says, when the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, <coughs> and at the sound of a trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, so that everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. David Cloud, in a site called The Way of Literature, says this, Israel was guided by silver trumpets. They were called Chatso, Chats, Chatso Sarah. This is found in Numbers chapter 10. The priests used these trumpets to call the assembly and to sound the alarm for war. The silver trumpets symbolize the guidance of God in the churches. The two trumpets depict the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, which always agree in one. The fact that the trumpets were silver reminds us that God's guidance is predicated upon his redemption. He guides us because he has redeemed us. Silver spoke of a price of redemption in Exodus chapter 30. As the priest determined God's mind and communication and communicated it to the camp, the churches are guided by God-called pastors who sound out the mind of God to the assembly. Number three was the torch. This is the light. The torch was concealed in the jar until the moment when Gideon broke his jar. All the light from all the jars surrounded the Midianite camp. The light penetrated the darkness of night. The light brought victory. We carry the light. We carry the light, the Holy Spirit in us, and this light, we carry it. John 1, you know one of these verses, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The light of God himself is in us who believe. The light is in us. The torch is inside of us. Gideon and his 300 men carried the light that would bring victory in light-concealing jars. The jar had to be open on top. It had to be. The torch wouldn't stay lit without oxygen. The fire probably burned dimly while it was in the jar, but the torch had to get out of the jar to get it to burn brightly, to get the light to penetrate darkness, they had to break the jar. Smash the pot. They only had two hands. They couldn't be carrying the jar. They couldn't carry the jar and the trumpet and the torch. They didn't even have a sword in their hand. Maybe they had one on their side. I don't know. But when the jars were smashed, the torches flared up in the rush of air and between the, between the sudden illumination and the surrounding shouting and trumpet blast, the enemy was defeated in confusion. We are in 
a war. There's a war on. The battlefield is one on one. The ungodly culture is an enemy, but the real enemy is Satan and his helpers, the demons. Satan does his best to keep his activities in the dark. Light always dispels darkness. Always. You can have a... You ever been in, in, in a cavern where they turn all the lights off and you can't even see your hand in front of your face? Ever been in one of those kind of places? But you can light a flickering little flame and all of a sudden you can see it penetrates the dark. But darkness cannot penetrate light. It's not possible. Dark, you can put an interference, you can make a shadow. That's why the earth gets dark at night because it, it's in its own shadow. The sun is still there. Darkness can't penetrate light. God's holy light will win over the darkness of sin every time. We carry the light, God's holy light. We carry it. We have this light in us to win battles for souls. We only have to break the pot. We only have to smash the pot. Matthew chapter 5, 14 and 16, you are the light of the world. That's us. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, verse 16, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. In other words, smash the pot. <laughs> let your light shine. It's in you. Be the light in your community. Be the light in your neighborhood, among your friends and co-workers. Carry the light of the gospel, unhidden, not in a jar. Smash the jar. Don't be afraid. Be God's messenger. Bear it. Tell it. Share it. Break the jar. Smash the pot. If you carry the goodness of God around in you and never say anything about it, never declare it to people, then it's in a jar and it doesn't light anyone's way. Then it's in a jar. So I'm saying, smash the jar. <laughs> Break the pot. Let the goodness of God come out from you and affect other people. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Dear Lord, it's been good to be in your house and to feast on your word today, Lord. To feast on your, on your holy word, your holy mortals. And I pray that this challenge falls onto all of us, Lord, we become less afraid and more bold and adventurous in the battles, Lord. And we can win people's souls one at a time, one at a time. All we have to do is not be afraid, not to hide the light that's in us. Smash the pot. Help us with that, Lord. Help us with that. As we go forth then to our own Homes, Lord, keep us all safe when we meet again. And uh, help us to win some souls this week, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, still